Throughout history, we have witnessed different wars, from wars between countries to wars between tribes, and sometimes these wars were caused by situations that could have just been avoided but were not. And so, hundreds of lives have been lost in the process. When it comes to war between tribes, we have witnessed the Hutus and Tutsis, War of Rwanda, the Hausas and Igbos, Strife of Nigeria, and in this video, we would be looking at the Zulu and Pondo, Strife of South Africa. There are four major ethnic divisions among black South Africans. There are the Nguni, Soto, Shangan Songa, and Venga. However, the Nguni represents almost two-thirds of South Africa's black population and is divided into four diverse groups. The Northern and Central Nguni are the Zulu-speaking people, the Southern Nguni are the Tsosa-speaking people, the Swazi people from Swaziland and neighboring areas, and the Ndembele people of the Northern Province and Mpumalanga. But our focus is on the Zulu people. Before the Zulu were forged as a formidable nation, they lived as isolated family groups and somewhat nomadic Northern Nguni groups. At the time, these isolated groups moved about within their loosely defined territories looking for game and good grazing for their cattle. As they grew, they amassed livestock and they dispersed in different direction with their family leaders and supporters. But they maintained family networks. In the Zulu family, the extended family and other members of the household were together because of social obligations. And this family arrangement was largely self-sufficient because roles and responsibilities were divided according to gender. The Zulu men were responsible for defending the home, caring for the cattle, making and maintaining weapons and farm implements, and building the home. Women, on the other hand, were responsible for domestic and agricultural chores. They raised crops, mainly grain, close to the household. By the 18th century, a number of powerful chiefdoms began to emerge to form political unification among the groups. With time, the dispersed family settlements transformed from a pastoral society to a more organized statehood. These powerful leaders and chiefs held more power over their supporters and they were able to gather more from the chiefdoms than they conquered. These chiefs began rising as supreme leaders and before long, they experienced changes in their political, social, and economical status. The Zulu chiefs acquired great wealth, commanded large armies, and conquered neighboring chiefdoms, and their military triumphs allowed the men to achieve status distinctions. By the 19th century, the warrior king Shaka, who was the illegitimate son of Senza Ngakahona, the chief of the Zulus, took over power after his father died. Shake assumed the leadership of the entire Mutetwa alliance. He conquered all the groups in Zululand and united them into a single powerful Zulu nation. He initiated many military reforms, including recruiting young men from all over the kingdom and training them in his own unique warrior tactics. Within 12 years, under Shaka's leadership, the Zulu nation became one of the mightiest empires in Africa. But after he died in 1828, the Zulu Empire weakened. It was also around the late 1800s that the British troops invaded the Zulu territory and divided Zululand into different chiefdoms. It was one of the most significant events in Natal. After Natal received colonial government in 1893, the Zulu people were discontented about being governed by the colony. However, Many Zulu people converted to Christianity under colonialism, but many of the people still hold on to their sensual beliefs. They believe in the use of magic and ancestral spirits. The Zulu people speak the Zulu language, which is a part of the Nguni language group and has many variations. But Isizulu is the most widely spoken official language in South Africa. The Zulu people are the largest ethnic group and nation in South Africa with close to 15 million people. They are fond of singing as well as dancing. Their folk for is transmitted through storytelling, praise poems and proverbs that illustrate Zulu history and teach moral lessons. 
the Zulu people are known for their weaving, craft making, pottery, and beadwork. The Amapondo or the Mpondo Kingdom was established as far back as the year 1282. They were under the rule of King Mpondo Kanjaya and they refer to themselves as the Amapondo. Today, the Pondo people have a total population of 5 million people. The Mpondo people are part of the Abambo group, a powerful Mbo nation who are thought to have migrated from the Great Lakes into what we know now as South Africa. Mpondo can also be spelled Pondo, are a group of Nguni-speaking people that have occupied the area between the Mtata and the Mtavuna rivers in eastern province of South Africa. In the early 19th century, the Mpondo people shared with other Nguni speakers a basic social organization and culture that distinguished them from other South African people. Like the Zulus, they settled in dispersed households. The men were responsible for cattle raising, which was a major role in both subsistence and social relations, while the women were responsible for agriculture. Their political system was similar to the Zulus as the structure was made of chiefdoms. In the 1820s, the Pondo people experienced a series of wars known as the Mfekane, meaning the crushing. It was a result of Shaka's policies when he was expanding and unifying all neighboring chiefdoms to form the Zulu nation. Safe to say, this is where the Zulu and Pondo fight started. In 1828, the Zulu defeated them, which made many of the Pondos flee as refugees across Mzimvubu River, causing them to lose their lands and their cattle. However, after fleeing, the Mpondo people were reorganized under the leadership of their chief, Faku. Faku used the Zulu military model to establish an army. They regulated the production of grain for sale so that they could nurture the rebuilding of their cattle herds. By the early 1840s, Faku had recreated the Mpondo state, and by 1860, he ruled over a state that had over 100,000 people. When the European traders came in the 1860s, they established many taking posts throughout the Mpondo territory and the Mpondo people traded cattle and hides for agricultural implements, luxury items and weapons and the Mpondo state grew steadily. However, the colonial government of both the Cape Colony and Natal wanted the Pondo territory for themselves and the civil conflict among competing Pondo groups allowed the Cape government to take over the Mpondo territory. In 1897, the Mpondo people lost their political independence and stability after suffering a rinderpest epidemic that annihilated their hearts. Years later, in 1913, when the Natives Land Act was passed to give the best lands to the white population, the Mpondo people did not really feel the impact because it was less severe on them. This allowed them to grow and made it easy for the state to accept the continued legitimacy of Mpondo chiefly constitutions. As such, it was easy for South Africans to employ Mpondo territory as a major part of the Nguni-speaking Transkei. Before the 1985 all-out war between the Zulu tribe and the Pondo tribe, the traditional territory of the Pondos was connected to the Zulus, which was referred to as South Africa's Natal province. However, the tribal fight had been going on for years, with the death tolls usually much lower from such clashes. On Christmas Eve of 1985, the Zulus and the Pondos clashed in what police officers described as the worst factional fighting in years between the tribes in South Africa. At first, it was reported that the reason for the clash was unclear, but in the past, there have been clashes over issues such as water rights. The tribal conflict was often referred as tribal clashes or faction fighting, and this all-out war was a result of their intense rivalry for lands, water, and jobs. Between December 1985 and January 1986, intense conflict broke out between the Zulus and Pondos living in Umbumbulu, particularly in Kwamakuta and Malukazi. The ethnic nature of the conflict supported the state's opinion 
that the conflict in the province was black on black. As such, it delayed the efforts of security forces to intervene in a way that would have limited the number of sufferings and losses. Because of the lack of land, water and jobs, many people moved to Durban as quarters. Before long, the population in Durban grew more around half a million in 1979 to 1 1.3 million in 1985. Unfortunately, the arrival of a large number of people to Durban increased the struggle for access to basic resources such as water, land and employment. However, many of the people that moved to Durban were Pondos, thousands of them, and because they were easily distinguished from Zulus as a group, they were resented for intruding on the scarce resources. This was also because at the time, land was informally allocated by powerful local figures and councillors, and certain tribal leaders favoured Pondos, this made the Zulus dislike them even more. In December 1985, the head of the Umbumbulu tribe, Chief Mahanya, insisted that all Pondos living in Kwamakuta without his permission should leave and return to the Transkei. Also, the KwaZulu representative for Umlazi warned that there would be more bloodshed if the Pondos did not leave. Meanwhile, the Transkei administration was in support of the Pondos not leaving. As a result, a serious clash broke out between the Zulus and Pondos at Malukazi, Umlazi on Christmas Eve in 1985. It was reported that 2,000 Zulus clashed with 3,000 members of the Pondo tribe, resulting in over 53 deaths and up to 500 serious injuries. The men were armed with spears, machetes, and homemade guns. Eyewitness accounts and some police officers reported that it was a bloody fight as the grass was red. A police officer recounted, there were so many bodies out there that they were literally tripping over them. The faction fighting at Umbubulu turned Christmas into the bloodiest day in more than a year of political violence. The battle was so ferocious that many of the people killed in the clash were hacked to death, dismembered or beheaded. Many more had spears driven through their bodies that ripped holes in their flesh. However, before the Christmas Eve clash, there was a clash between the two feuding tribes in Durban where at least 39 blacks were killed, and these clashes stemmed from the competition between the two tribes for jobs and political power. Even after the all-out war in December, many more people died as a result of scattered killings and revenge attacks. It was reported that on January 21, 1986, a Pondo man was killed in Isipingo Rail, and two days later, about 500 Pondos orchestrated a revenge attack on the home and shopping centers of the KwaZulu representative for Umbumbulu. Meanwhile, about 1,000 Zulu tribesmen intercepted the Pondos, and there was an ensuing gun battle on the road between Umbogitwini and Kwamakuta. Homes were looted and set ablaze, and about 45 people were killed that day. Also, about 20,000 to 40,000 Pondos fled Kwamakuta. Some fled back to Transkei, while some sought refuge in and around Durban or hid in bushes and old railway coaches. The incessant killings stunned Bishop Desmond Tutu, the 1984 winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, to call for peace in his Christmas sermon. He urged people saying, let us work so that Christmas 1986, unlike Christmas 1985, will be one where all of us, black and white, will be able to say indeed that God is with us. The killing and clashes did not stop immediately, but now things are better than they used to be. And with that, we have come to the end of this video. For more interesting videos like this, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and turn on the bell notification so you never miss an upload. Thank you very much.